So uh, we, we talked about praying like the saints of, of old and those, uh, those prayers that had a few more words than that, just those short prayers. Uh, but tonight I want to talk with you about tabernacle praying. Tabernacle praying. Uh, what, what do we mean when we hear the word tabernacle? What, what is a, a tabernacle or what is the tabernacle? You can, t- you can say it out loud. It's all right. A church, a church building. It's, it's like a church building, similar to a church building. That's right. The word tabernacle actually could be translated into a short word, which is tent. Yeah. It was uh, the tabernacle in the Old Testament was a tent of meeting. You remember that the people of Israel had been delivered uh, from the bondage in Egypt, and uh, they were on their way out, uh, but they did not have a place of worship. And at that time, they were, they were nomads. They were pilgrims. They were traveling through uh, the wilderness. So God set up for them a portable, yes, Francis, church building, essentially, a portable place where people could meet with God, where, where God would manifest himself. And uh, the, the tabernacle was a, uh, a, a, a tent uh, that was enclosed in a courtyard. I'm going to give you a little... Uh, Awful simple uh, sketch of that here in ju- just a minute. Uh, many of you have seen in study Bibles and things like that uh, pictures of, of the tabernacle. But uh, as the people journeyed, uh, you remember they had a way to be guided uh, in the daytime by what? P- uh, a pillar of fire. I mean, a cloud. Nope, you're right. A cloud in the daytime and at night. I already gave it away. A pillar of fire, right? So they could uh, see to travel. And as long as God was uh, out before them in a cloud in, in uh, the daytime or a pillar of fire at night, they were to travel. When that stopped, they were to stop. And so they pitched their tents all around. And the, the people who were designed uh, to do that, uh, the priests and the Levites, set up the big tent in the center of all the tents that were around. You know, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. We're not just talking about a few hundred people or whatever. We're just talking about a massive number of people that came out, exodus out of uh, Egypt and headed toward the promised land. But the tabernacle was a, a, a place of, of worship where God met. You know, he's talking about that cloud. The, the great cloud of God's presence would appear in the tabernacle, and people would see uh, there was a word for that. You remember that word? Called the Shekinah glory of God. And uh, that was that, that indicating that uh, God was pleased with the people's obedience and with their, their worship, and he was coming among them. Well, the tabernacle itself is a pattern for our daily prayer life. Uh, I don't think that God intended for that to be the only thing about the tabernacle. God gave them specific instructions about how to set it up, the length of it, the width of it, the coverings over it. Those uh, animal coverings over the tabernacle all were representative of actually the coming gospel and the truth of the, of the gospel. I'm not going to get into the coverings tonight, uh, just actually the inside of, of the tabernacle. But I'm going to give you all a little sheet if you all would just... Pass these around. Yeah, Steve, if you don't mind helping us, that's yours too. Uh, in, inside this little Steve. folder are two, uh, two things. One is, a, I told you it's very simple. It came out of a, uh, a little Bible study book that I had a number of years ago. And uh, Jonathan was so gracious to help me get it uh, printed off here and folded for y'all tonight. Uh, the top picture... And I don't know if I hold it up here, if y'all can, uh, I think you can probably see that. Uh, the top picture, because mine's better than the ones everybody else has here. Mine's a little bit in color. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the gray parts that you see on the, thank you, sir, on the uh, actual diagram are, it's like a overhead picture, so to speak. If you had a uh, one of uh, Jonathan's, uh, what do you call that thing? Flies oh, drone. Yeah, one of his uh, drones flying overhead. Uh, that would sort of be the picture of the uh, tabernacle. It's very simple, y'all, and so forgive me for not having it more complicated than that, but you see that all around the outside area uh, was uh, this fence that was made out of linen, and then the uh, pillars that were holding that uh, fence up, uh, that uh, linen cloth fence, uh, were all uh, bronze uh, pillars. 
uh, outdoor things uh, in the way of furnish furnishings were bronze. Indoor things in the way of furnishings were gold. Uh, so the outdoor things that could uh, kind of stand the weather, so to speak, uh, made out of, they, and you know, the Old Testament sometimes calls, calls them the brazen, uh, uh, B-R-A-Z-E-N, brazen furniture, but to us that's the same word as brass. And uh, you see that in the top picture, uh, it sort of looks down on it with the one piece of furniture that you come into the gate and then the next is in the middle, and then inside the holy place and the holy of holies, that was the tabernacle itself. But all of that was considered a portion of the tabernacle. Just like today, you think about going into the temple. Uh, the temple area was a large courtyard area. It wasn't just the building itself. And so the tabernacle area was not just the, the tent itself, but that whole courtyard area was considered holy ground, and a place where people met with God. Then the bottom picture is uh, like you went inside uh, the holy place, inside the tabernacle itself, and you were looking from the front of it. Over on the uh, left-hand side is the, uh, the candlesticks, uh, the seven-branched uh, candlesticks. Uh, the Bible calls it the lamp stand. And then over on the, uh, over on the right-hand side is the table that had 12 loaves of showbread on it. And then we have, uh, we've torn down the veil like it got torn down in uh, the New Testament times in the, in the temple. So we've just opened it up. And back there at the very back, the areas that are gray in your uh, thing are actually gold because all the inside panels uh, were made of gold. On the inside is the Ark of the Covenant. And that was the, uh, that box that looks about the size of a casket. Uh, and inside were three objects. Does anybody remember what the three objects inside the Ark of the Covenant were? One was Aaron's rod, Aaron's rod that, that budded. Wasn't Joseph's bones? Ma'am? Was it Joseph's No, Joseph's bones were indeed uh, uh, important to the people, and they did carry them uh, later. But the three things in the Ark were the manna, the manna, the manna a, a bowl of manna that you remember was uh, available to people to be picked up every day. But if they, if they waited until the next day, it would get bad. And, you know, they had to do it fresh every day. But miraculously, the manna that they put in the jar and put inside the Ark of the Covenant was preserved and uh, didn't, didn't ever go bad, didn't turn to worms or whatever. And the third thing that was in there was Aaron's rod that budded. So the Ten Commandments, the, the jar of manna, and, and, the, uh, and Aaron, Aaron's rod that budded. But that's a, that's a whole other story. But... What I'm trying to say to you is that this overall view and then the inside view of the holy place and the holy of holies. Uh, uh, oh, and actually the Ark of the Covenant is two pieces of furniture. The Ark itself and then in one uh, gold-shaped piece, the two cherubim with wings that are facing each other and pointing to each other. And you can see them uh, there uh, on the top of the Ark. I, uh, I went to Israel a few weeks ago, Jolene and I did, mm -hmm. and in one of the shops we were looking, they, they had a lot of replicas of the Ark of the Covenant, mm -hmm. you know, covered over with gold. You could buy different sizes. And one of the ministers, who was very knowledgeable, uh, called me over and said, what do you see on, on top of the, 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 it's called the mercy seat, uh, that, the top lid of, of the Ark, and it was a round wheel-like structure that looked like it was up from the top of the Ark of the Covenant, about, about that high up. And I said, I don't know. What is that? He said, it's the mercy seat. Well, I've seen pictures of the Ark for 70-something uh, years, o o over the years, and I had never. And so before I came here tonight, I looked up online, and sure enough, you see a lot of the replicas of the Ark of the Covenant and on the top, in the center of the top, is this round, wheel-like looking structure that I never knew was a part of the lid of the Ark of the Covenant that uh, we call the mercy seat. I'll talk about why we call it the mercy seat in just a minute. Okay, so with that in mind, with the kind of the graphic that you see, let's talk about how the, uh, how the tabernacle itself could be like our prayer time. Uh, one of the things you remember that Jesus said to his disciples as he was facing the cross and uh, was uh, calling them to prayer, you remember he, he said this, 
could you not watch with me for one hour? Uh, the disciples just, you know, they grew weary. They fell asleep while Jesus was agonizing over the sin debt that he would, uh, that he would pay and becoming sin for us. Uh, so the, uh, the, that's a great question. Could we, any of us, not watch with him for one hour? You know, most of the time you begin to pray and say, Lord, you know, like we did tonight, pray, pray for these folks going through this and pray for these in the military and these missionaries and the world situation and our, our officers of the land and elected officials and our people that are, you know, uh, first responders and, you know, all of that. Uh, and uh, I've just been talking for about 60 seconds. And if you just, you know, you, you find out that you can pray for all those things and not be praying a very long time. So how can our prayer time increase that we feel like we've really spent an adequate time with the Lord? Well, there are several different ways, and I've only got one listed here tonight. There, uh, another way is following the, the model prayer that Jesus prayed and just using a phrase at the time. But I, I think that the tabernacle is at least just a, a thought of how our prayer life can have a, a, a good pattern. So here, here's what I'm suggesting to you. Uh, tonight, there, uh, uh, the Bible study, by the way, is found in Exodus chapter 40. So if you want to turn in your Bible there, it's not really a Bible study as such. I'm just giving you that reference to remind you. Exodus chapter 40. And, of course, Exodus is, uh, the, the last chapters in Exodus is all about the tabernacle. The materials in the t tabernacle, the garments that the priests would wear, the anointing oil that they used. But uh, in, uh, in the very first verse of chapter 40, here's what we read. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month. Now what would the first day of the first month be? In our day, it would be January 1st, right? The first day of the year. So he's saying it's a new day, it's a new year. So on the first day of the first month, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. And so then he's describing what that's like. You shall put in it the ark of the testimony and, a, and petition off the ark with the veil. So he's starting at the back of the tabernacle, so to speak, and there's the ark, that box with the cherubim on it, uh, with their wings outspread facing each other. You shall put the ark of the testimony. You shall bring in the table and arrange the things that are to be set in order on it, and you shall... So that's the table of showbread. They had 12 loaves of bread every day that they put out fresh uh, loaves of bread that were showbread. That means this was, uh, this was something that the priests uh, would, uh, would use and uh, so forth. And so it was put out there on the table. And you shall bring in the lampstand and light its lamp. So that's the seven branch uh, lampstand that, that they light. So you've got, the, you've got the table of showbread over on the right of the holy place and the lampstand over on the left. You've got back behind the veil, the ark. And then verse five says, you shall also set up the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony. So just like the ark is behind the veil, in front of the veil is the altar of incense where they burned incense. You'd, you could see the smoke coming up. You could smell the incense uh, burning there. Then you shall set the altar of the burnt offering. So now, the person is walking all the way to the front of the courtyard there where people would come in and the burnt offering altar is right there at the very beginning. And it says, before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, and you shall set the laver between the tabernacle of meeting <coughs> and the altar and put, put water in it. And uh, Laver is another word for us for laboratory or uh, just basin, but it was a very, very large basin. So don't think of it like kind of like a wash basin at the house. Uh, this was a huge uh, basin that the priests could reach their hands in and, and wash their hands and also put their feet in. It was like a two-pronged, uh, two huge uh, bowl that they, would, uh, that they would cleanse themselves in the, the labor. Okay? All right, with that in mind, let's, uh, let's, do, a, let's do a prayer experience using the... Uh, the furniture in the tabernacle as, as an example. So this, uh, you, you got the picture of uh, kind of an, uh, uh, an entrance way that you would come in and let's enter there and as soon as we enter, we're in front of the 
uh, altar uh, of sacrifice. And I think about uh, Hebrews 13, 15, and I'll read that for you uh, because that's an important, Hebrews 13, 15, as we enter uh, the gate and come before the, it says, therefore by him, that is by Jesus, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks in his name. So how do we enter into the presence of God? We enter in his presence with praise and thanksgiving. Uh, the Bible says, enter into his courts with thanksgiving and into his, in his, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. That's Psalm 100 verse uh, 4. So uh, how do we start a proper prayer time? Well, we start with thanksgiving and praise. Lord, I just thank you for... Uh, what you've done, and I praise you for who you are, and you know, just uh, entering, uh, thinking about the things that we thank him for, and thinking about his attributes that we we praise him for. You know, uh, you, you think, well, uh, my you know, my beginning prayer, if I'm going to do praise and thanksgiving, I'll just uh, I'll sing a song. Yeah, amen. Sing a song. I'll offer a psalm. Amen. Uh, uh, read read to God a, a psalm of praise and, and thanksgiving. At the very beginning of prayer, I think we, we enter into his presence with thanksgiving and with praise. That's, that's, how, that's the door into prayer. So that, that's the very uh, beginning time. So uh, let's say that we just spend a uh, you know, kind of undetermined amount of time in praise and thanksgiving. Well, that's just, that's just okay. Uh, God will be honored uh, with that. You know, we, uh, we, we get alone in our prayer closet. Jesus said, when you pray, enter into the closet. We, by the way, I, I don't know how you all uh, do this on a daily basis. Uh, for I am not a morning person. I never have been. All through my college years, I was more of a nighttime person, staying up studying and all that. Jolene's more of a morning person. But since I've uh, grow, been growing in the Christian life and so forth, I've had to become more of a morning person. And so my morning times are times when I meet with the Lord. Lots of times there are things that get in the way, and so I had to get up a little bit earlier because I just do not want to miss that time uh, with God. I don't know how many of you remember a, a book that came out a number of years ago. Billy Graham endorsed it and encouraged people to have it called My Heart, Christ's Home. And it's a, a book mainly for new Christians about how... Uh, our heart is a lot like a home and we invite Christ Jesus to come in and show him the rooms in our heart, so to speak, and uh, the kitchen where we uh, have our appetites uh, whetted and uh, the living room where we, uh, I don't know how y'all, y'all's house is, uh, our living room is not really our living room. Our living room is where we might have guests in and everything stays picked up and, you know, all that. People can kind of come. It's not the, our, our den is our living room. That's kind of where, where we live. Well, if the living room is sort of the, the show place or whatever, that's our outward appearance. But the, the den of our heart, it, that's where we are ourselves. We're just hanging out. We're, we're who we really are. Uh, you know, if you want to know what somebody's Christian life is, just ask the people who are closest to them uh, because they, they know us the best, don't they? So, uh, so all, all the, that little book is all about the different rooms in our house and how we invite the Lord Jesus to come into every area. I remember when I first read the book, there was one uh, area of my life that I sort of uh, kept to myself, I guess you could say. It was kind of a, uh, a secret secrets maybe not the best word but a private area that uh, I would try to deal with from time to time and it would usually get uh, messed up again uh, kind of a habitual thing and I had to finally come to the place of opening the door of that place and saying Lord Jesus here I'm giving I'm giving this to you I'm not able to keep trying to fix it up and make it okay uh, I grew up on radio I don't, uh, I don't know how many of you grew up listening to radio. I'm, I'm the older one in the room here, so I can uh, say that I grew up listening to radio. Uh, but one of my favorite radio shows was Fibber McGee and Molly. And uh, Fibber uh, McGee was this character who had in his home a closet that in every episode he would go to and open the door 
and things would just come falling out. And you'd hear the sounds of uh, crashing and moaning and groaning as things tumped over on fiber. And he, always, he, he did it every day. He'd push it back in and close the door and everything would be fine for a while until the next episode came on and fiber would need something out of the hall closet. And he, he Well, you know, most of us kind of have a hall closet in our life. It's that area that we sort of hope is going to get better and then first thing you know we open the door and there it comes piling in on, on top of us so part of the praise and worship time is to open every area of our life to the lord and say god here's this room here's fibber's closet here here's this area in my life i open it to you so that's the first thing entering into his gates coming before the altar of sacrifice so to speak with thanksgiving and with praise and then we stop at the labor now, again, I said that the labor, that was where the priest would stop for cleansing. The labor was uh, for cleansing. You know, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So uh, the, the Lord Jesus Christ is our place of cleansing when we confess and we forsake specific sin. You remember the young man who uh, was in a revival meeting and uh, he got came under conviction, and he went forward and knelt at the altar, and uh, he was just kind of quiet there. And a pastor came along, put his arm around him, and said, uh, "Son, uh, are you okay?" He said, uh, "No." And he said, "Well, then, son, uh, confess your sins." And he said, "Well, I can't think of any." And the pastor said, "Well, son, guess at it." And so the, the story says he guessed it first thing. Uh, so, you know, I think any time we come uh, to the labor, uh, if we just sort of guess at our sins, we'll be able to guess it first thing, you know. Uh, so uh, certainly uh, uh, the early on in our time of prayer, there must be that, that confession where we, where we deal specifically with our sin. And, you know, it, it's uh, what is that song says? Not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And so that's really what the, the labor is. And uh, now, now, what am I saying? Am I saying that you need to have this picture before you? No, I'm just saying that if we have in mind kind of what the tabernacle was like, and in our prayer time we're trying to enter into these different areas and think about those different uh, furnishing. So we enter in, we stop at the labor for cleansing, and then we proceed into the holy place. Uh, and th there were those three items of furniture in the holy place. And what were they? Over here on the left, the candlestick, the, the, the lampstand. Over here on the right, the table of showbread. And in the middle was the incense uh, altar. And uh, so I think that as we, as we go there, we can we can ask uh, for God to show us about those three items of furniture. First, the seven-branch candlestick. Now, uh, I think it can mean a lot of things, y'all, but I believe the main uh, picture of that, that lighted lampstand is the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He is that, he is that influence. He is that revealer. He is that illuminator uh, of the Scripture. Uh, Jesus said, I'm going to send him on after he... Uh, died and, and was buried and ascended up into heaven. I'll, I'll send, send the comforter and he will show you all things. He will reveal. The Holy Spirit is really the other personality of Jesus. And the other personality of Jesus can indwell us and live in us. He's, he, he's able to be everywhere all at the same time because he is a spirit. He's not a, 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 a flesh and blood like Jesus was just limited to that his other personality can be everywhere all at the same time and so we think about him bringing enlightenment and the fire of the Holy Spirit remember what happened to the early disciples on the day of Pentecost uh, the Holy Spirit descended on them like tongues of fire so that again is a picture there of the, of the lampstand and so I think what we do when we kind of stand in our mind and heart in front of the lampstand is we, we ask the Holy Spirit to search us, to show us, to send us, and to accept his, his filling and his anointing. Uh, Y'all know that the Holy Spirit, uh, when, when we get saved, he baptizes us into the family of God. You know, we've got some, some brothers and sisters that we know and, and love who believe that you get saved, and then there's a second blessing that comes in the way of a baptism. But actually, 
uh, the Bible, you remember that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian congregation, and he said, by one spirit, you all have been baptized into Christ. So, and, and some of them were not the most spiritual Christians. Some of them in Corinth were still had a good bit of the flesh left, and yet Paul said, you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. So when a person surrenders to Jesus and receives him as their Savior, right then they are baptized into Christ's body. That's the baptism. So there's, I believe there's one baptism, and that's what, that happens at salvation. But I believe there are many fillings and that is when we, uh, you know, we're, we're just, we don't know what to do. We say, Holy Spirit, fill me for this. I, I don't know how to make this choice. I don't know how to, how to deal with this situation. Uh, Holy Spirit, fill me. And then uh, I think that there are from time to time anointings of the Holy Spirit. Where, you know, you're, you're trying to witness to somebody. And all of a sudden these scriptures come back to your mind. These thoughts come into your mind that you want us to kind of say, where did that come from? Well, the Holy Spirit is anointing you in that witnessing situation so you can uh, bear a, a witness for the gospel to that uh, person that you're talking to. So I believe there's one baptism, there are many fillings, and there are frequent anointings of the Holy Spirit. That's a work that he does. So, so as, as, see, I'm still talking about your prayer time. As you're praying and you think about standing in front of the the uh, candelabra there, the, the seven branch candlestick and the lampstand that, by the way, lampstand, uh, wh why would we, why is it called a lampstand? Because in those days, like you see a candelabra that's got seven candles coming up from it. Well, they didn't have candles then, but they had little lamps that they would put on the, on the edge of each of these uh, lamp stands, so to speak, with a wick coming out, or not always a wick, just oil down inside there that was burning and a flame would come out of the little lamp. So they were lamp stands because they were these little uh, burning lamps that were on the end of each of those stands, set seven uh, stands. So, so it was like a candle arbor, but no candles, just the little tiny... Hand, you know, you re remember the, Jesus telling the story of the, the uh, five wise virgins, the five foolish virgins, uh, and they, they had their lamps. Well, they had in their hands a little, a little tiny lamp with oil in it and perhaps a wick coming up by New Testament times, but if not a wick, still uh, the flame uh, lit by the oil and, and uh, burning. And then if the oil ran out, what would happen? No, no more light. That was that was the end of it. So you have to go to the oil store and, and uh, you know get you. Well, Jesus told the story of these foolish virgins that uh, let their they just kept their lamps burning when they didn't need to burn and they used up the oil. And then uh, the the bridegroom called for the wedding to start and all the the bridesmaids were to come forward uh, and some of them were out of oil and they're going to have to go get oil. And it, by the time the wedding started, they didn't get back in time, and they, they missed out on, on the wedding. And, and Jesus said, keep your lamps trimmed and burning and keep you know, being aware that I'm coming back and be ready for me to, to, to return. So the lamp stand was those, those little lamps that were there. Uh, but all of that uh, being a kind of a picture of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, you know, fill me and use me. That's, that's over on the left-hand side of the holy place. Then over on the right-hand side of the holy place, is that table of showbread. Now, what, what should that make us think of? Well, that makes us think of the daily nourishment that we need and the strength from what? God's Word. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know about you, but uh, prayer for me is not just me talking. Prayer for me is me listening. And so I talk to God, and He talks to me. And how does He talk to me? He talks to me through His Word. So a part of our hour of prayer or our at least a few minutes of prayer or hopefully 30 minutes or more of prayer is hearing from God and that is some kind of systematic way that we read the Bible. You know, I, I, I think the best way to read it is a systematic plan. Either a chapter a day, a psalm, a proverb a day, or something, you know, something else a day. Read through the Bible in a year or in two years or in three years and Read a chap I think a chapter a day just about helps you to read through it almost in one year. You have to get, go a little bit longer than that if you read just one chapter a day. What did I say a year? Three, three years will uh, you can read through the Bible in uh, a chapter a day. Uh, but, you know, there are all these plans. You can get a one-year Bible and a two-year Bible, but some kind of systematic way. You know, you don't just open the Bible and say, okay, here, you know, I'm going to uh, re read here today. You remember the guy that said... Uh, 
Lord, I tell you what, I'm just going to open the Bible and whatever it says, that's what I'm going to do. And Judas went out and hanged himself. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, so uh, he, he said, uh, uh, no, Lord, let me try again. And so he did, go and do thou likewise. So uh, uh, that, that's just not the best plan, uh, hit and miss type uh, plan for, for, you know, for Bible study. It's best to have some sort of systematic way where God speaks to us. But the table represents the word of God and the daily nourishment that we get. So, you know, I've got verbs here for each of these to enter the gates, to stop at the labor, to proceed to the holy uh, place and stand before the uh, before the lampstand, and then to sit at the table. May, maybe you don't have all these positions in prayer, but it's not it's not bad to even think about these. But then to to go in uh, to go still stay in the holy place. Three items of furniture: the lampstand, the table, and that uh, incense altar, the golden incense altar. You know, in Revelation 5, 8, uh, there's a specific reference to the incense. And John, the revelator, asked God, what was he seeing? And he said, this incense is the prayers of God's people, the prayers of the saints. And so symbolically, the incense in, in, the, uh, in the tabernacle is for intercession. It's when we, we pray for other people. We ask God's blessings on them. That's what we've been doing here tonight. And that's certainly an important phase of prayer but y'all that's not the only phase of prayer but it is very very important pray for pastors pray for you know people in uh, on the mission field pray for evangelists pray for those who uh one one night i'll come and just talk with you about praying for specific things on specific days won't have time to do that tonight obviously but uh we'll just talk about that it's something i found uh very helpful but uh, there the intercession thing is you can see, you know, uh, praying for family, praying for your church, praying for staff and missionaries and uh, daily requests. I've jotted down there First Baptist Church because that was a church I've been involved in for the last um, 10 years. And so, but you, of course, it would be Dalewood Baptist and uh, so forth and the staff and then uh, other, you know, the uh, get out your table talk in your, in your prayer time and go, go through that. You know, not just on Wednesday night. I'm sure many of you probably already do that and, and uh, that's great. And then the last two things are to, uh, hey, y'all, we, we have an opportunity to do something Old Testament saints can't do, and that is we can go inside the Holy of Holies. And why is that? Because when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that that veil that was between the holy place and the Holy of Holies was torn. How was it torn? Top to from bottom. top to bottom. That's right. So it was as if God reached down from heaven and said, you know, this is wide open now, and people are no longer having to be back in just the holy place now they can come into the very holy of holies, the presence of God. Hey, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, I hear different people say they think they know where it is over in Turkey somewhere, guarded by some uh, hooded uh, priests and so forth. I, I don't know that anybody knows where the Ark of the Covenant really is. I've heard a number of theories about it, but I do know that I can approach the Ark of the Covenant every day. I can come inside the Holy of Holies and uh, bow before the Lord Jesus Christ and my Ark of the Covenant and my cherubim is actually the presence of Jesus himself. And we can, we can come inside uh, that, uh, that presence and uh, we can just rejoice in the, in the presence of God. What was it that um, uh, the, the early uh, people said about the early Christians? They took note of them that they had what? Been with Jesus. Uh, what, what was it? Was it something about their speech? Was it something about their attitudes? Or something about the way they looked at things? Or was there a glow about them? I, I don't know, but I do think that uh, when we've been in the presence of Jesus, it shows. He just kind of, uh, I love this little thing. I'll be quoting it from time to time because it's one of my favorite pieces of doggerel. Uh, it's bubbling, it's bubbling, it's bubbling in my soul. There's laughing and singing since Jesus made me whole. Friends may not understand it, but I cannot keep it quiet. It's bubbling, 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 bubbling day and night. Uh, well, that's what happens when we get in the presence of Jesus. It's just... It just shows. You, you, you kind of can't keep it to yourself. It, it, it's going to show. So we reflect his glory. And then the very last thing, we start, we walk back through the tabernacle. And we get out there where people are. And we go and we tell others. I used to sing a song when I was a teenager. Saved, saved to tell others of the Christ of Calvary. And that's really what we're uh, supposed to do. So I think in our prayer time, we, uh, we, uh, we equip ourselves to share our faith with other people. It's not just a 
prayer time so we can check off the box and say, well, I did my quiet time today, but it's so we get that power within us so we can share the gospel with others. Well, that's just tabernacle praying. It's just a food for thought for, for you all. And uh, thank you all who joined us by phone and those of you who are watching on the, uh, on the uh, DVD. And I pray that uh, it's been a blessing to each of you. And I'm going to lead us in just a word of prayer. And then we can talk about this a little bit more if you need to. Father, we thank you tonight that we have the privilege, like the Old Testament believers, to go into the tabernacle. Thank you that we don't have to have that physical uh, linen fence to enter into a courtyard and to, to stand before those different items of furniture. But thank you that in our everyday life, we can enter into your presence with praise and thanksgiving. We can confess our sins and be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We can actually enter into the holy presence that you have by standing before the power of the Holy Spirit, asking him to fill us and, and opening up your word and reading from the bread of, of life and, and uh, being uh, in, in earnest <coughs> prayer for other people and as if the incense is flowing up to you as we intercede for others. And then now we don't have to be like the priest and only go once a year inside the Holy of Holies. Now we all get to go inside the Holy of Holies, Lord Jesus, because you paid the full debt for our sins and you've given us permission to come to you, our true Ark of the Covenant, and uh, angels can lead us right into your presence, and we thank you for that. And help us, Lord, in our daily life and help us as a congregation to be people of prayer. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.